Divine Truth Spirit Assistance Giving assistance to people who have lived on earth and who have now passed into the spirit world. In this recording titled, Juju asks about trust, intimacy and soulmate concepts, Mary channels Juju, formerly known as Constance, a woman who lived as a slave in the Indies over 300 years ago, who returns for the fourth time to ask about her progress in the fifth sphere in relation to her concepts and emotions surrounding God's truth about soulmates, trust, safety and intimacy. Recorded on the 25th of January 2019 from 11.30am in Rugsdale, Queensland, Australia. Session 4 Well, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Mary and I are here again. G'day, darling. How are you? Hi, darling. Yeah. This morning we were having a chat uh, with Constance again, and and there were some things that came up in the discussion that we thought we might just quickly put on camera, just so that those of you viewers who have watched the previous discussions we've had with Constance, remember at this stage we've had three previous discussions with her, and this will be our fourth. So. You probably need to watch the others in order to follow through with follow the flow of the of this conversation today. But uh, Constance is now in the fifth sphere of the spirit world, and she's been looking at some issues that uh, are keeping her in the fifth sphere. <laughs> and so we wanted to discuss those things with her today. And Mary and I were having a discussion this morning, just a relaxed discussion about soulmate issues, and Constance was involved in that discussion. So we thought we might as well put the discussion on camera and. And, uh, and hopefully it contains some truths that, that everyone who's listening will be able to help, will help them with their soulmate relationship. Mm. So that's our intention today. So we'll just uh, have a little pause while, while we just relax and connect with Constance and then we'll get started. Hello. <laughs> G'day Constance, how are you? Thank you. Or juju, as juju, I'm affectionately yeah, so yeah, yeah. called. Cool now, yeah. So yes. I'll, I'll keep, I'll use juju in future. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. I yeah. just do cherish the name. Yeah, it's, that's no worries. It's very significant to me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you for having me back. Mm, you're involved in our conversation this morning. Yes. Mm. Yes. I. Uh, I was speaking with Mary about. The fact that my progress has slowed somewhat mm -hmm. now that I've reached this state. I, as you know, I, well, I feel that I, I wasted a lot of time uh, after I first passed, caught up in some emotions. And then once I heard, again, I'm so grateful to you, once I heard the truth from you, I, I feel I changed quite a bit. Yes. <laughs> And now I'm on a sort of threshold here when it comes to the soulmate relationship, which I'm learning that there, there have been things that were, that were left uncovered up until this point inside of me. And it has been an interesting time at the moment to find things about myself but also about what it must mean i guess i am saying i i haven't found what all these things mean this soulmate relationship yeah and we were talking this morning weren't we about mary raised sort of the issue of trust how a lot of people believe that trust of the opposite gender is a is an issue when uh, and we were talking about tr the word trust actually weren't we and maybe that's a good place for us to start Yes, perhaps I should say what I said to Mary yes. so that people might understand. I found suddenly upon reaching this place that when it came to connection with a man, I, I found that there had been such a deep betrayal of what I was calling trust in my early life on earth that when it came to this point in my journey, suddenly issues relating to those things resurfaced. And 
or perhaps it is more correct to say surfaced, <laughs> I, to give some context or understanding, up until this point, I felt I had done a great deal to release the trauma and hurt of the past. So much sorrow and agony really passed from me. And I found, I think, as I said in our last discussion, such a fellowship with people of my original race, but also others. And I found myself enlivened. I found I had a sense of, well, family, I suppose you would call it, without any restrictive sense about that word. Just that I felt a deep love and joy in being a part, not just of a, a particular race, I felt that really there was some healing for me to do in relation to my identity as, as within a race. But then with all humanity, I felt this sort of closeness, I suppose, or that's what I thought, and love and, and a sense of happiness and desire to give. Yes, so Juju, in our conversation this morning, the conversation that I had with Mary and you were present, obviously, because that was raised through you saying that the main feeling you had was that you couldn't trust men or, or you couldn't trust uh, a relationship. And, uh, and myself and Mary then discussed a bit about trust, didn't we? And I just wondered uh, what, firstly, feelings cause you to feel that you couldn't trust the because uh, we need to talk about the issue of trust itself and because because it, a lot of people i feel have a have a misunderstanding of the word and and they tend to use it as a necessary as a necessary part of a relationship rather than seeing trust as a fear and and this was what our discussion was about this morning so i was just wondering what caused you to feel that you couldn't trust uh, a, a man or your soul mate in the first place well, <laughs> there's many reasons for that, I suppose, that originate in my earth-based experience. But I, I suppose I'm still learning a lot about why, because I see that while I let go of a lot of my pain and trauma from the earth life, or so I believed, there was still many fears, there are still certain fears inside of me where I feel that uh, to open in, I suppose I should call it an intimate way with another, another human being uh, feels quite frightening for yes, me. Yes. It, I felt I could not trust another in that very deep personal way. I suppose I had felt up until this point in the lower spheres a closeness. I had grown to have a closeness and a feeling of fellowship with others. But on reaching this point, I have come to discover there is far more to learn about myself personally and also what it means to connect to another person in this soulmate way. Yeah, so we're really talking about... Uh, that word that you chose there, intimacy, isn't it? Mm. That's the word that where most people have a lot of difficulty. So while they may have friendships and therefore call them those friendships relationships with others, at the end of the day, that is very, very different to having an intimate relationship with one person. And particularly if that person is the other half of yourself, it's very different to that because, because there's a whole heap of new experiences that go on in a relationship like that, which are not a part of a friendship type of relationship. Mm. Mm. And there is a couple of things that I think to, of when you speak of this. The first is that I've become accustomed here to an exchange of information and feelings within this friendship way yes. that you said. But I'm coming to see that it's almost as if... Uh, engagement with someone in this other soulmate way requires far more of myself it does yes. <laughs> and far more opening up of myself yes and this is why i feel we need to firstly talk a bit about the word trust because the word trust actually comes from a fear-based conception of a relationship 
And so there's a, there, there is a lot of words on earth, I feel, and trust is one of them, that are used on earth in order to portray something that is a good thing, but actually it comes from a, a source that is fear-related and so therefore actually a sin from God's perspective. Yes, I was so <laughs> interested in this discussion. Yeah, and, and, it, and it is so interesting how on earth we, we create all these words like trust in a relationship, for example, is one of the key parts of having a relationship. Another part of having a relationship on earth is you need to feel some level of safety in the relationship. That, that word is used quite frequently as well. Oh, he makes me or she makes me feel safe you know, to do, live my life or whatever. And these kind of words all come from fear, actually. So they are all covering over fears that exist inside of us. And as a result, we don't really see what the real basis of allowing a completely open and intimate relationship is because we're seeing trust as a necessary part of the relationship and we're seeing safety as a necessary part of the relationship. And, and those two things aren't actually a part of a soulmate relationship, actually. And, and so we need to come to understand why they wouldn't be and, and what would be a part of the relationship. And this all happens during this fifth sphere transition that you're going through. Yes, and I was very fascinated with this thing that you spoke of this morning, which was about desire. The absence of my trauma and me feeling uh, no longer angry, for example, with, the, with men or with oppressors is very different to me having a desire for intimacy. Yes, yes. <laughs> One doesn't necessarily follow the other. Yes, and in fact, uh, can, off, can frequently, um, ha there, is no, there is no uh, joining of one to the other in, in reality. <laughs> As I am yeah. learned. Yeah, that's right. So, so see, uh, by the time we reach the fifth sphere, as you know, a lot of our traumatic feelings have been released. A lot of our trauma has gone. So that, that's a good thing, obviously. And, and also we're not acting in our trauma so much anymore. So that's also a good thing. Um, but, but that doesn't mean that we've actually addressed any positive desire. So, so you could say, in some ways, you could say, if you're looking at a, at, a, at sort of a picture of it, on one hand, you've got all of these negative emotions that affect our life. And then on the other hand, you've got all these real positive desires that can affect our life. And to get from one place to the other, you've basically got to go and release all your negative feelings until you get sort of, you could say, down to the into this place where you're neutral you're sort of in it's like having a car on earth in neutral <laughs> you know, you, if you put your foot down and accelerate it doesn't go anywhere because the car is in neutral and it's sort of the same with our life we can release all of the trauma but still be in neutral mm. and still not really be embracing a desire for our life and development of intimacy requires moving from new, neutrality or friendly neutrality if we could call it that with all of our relationships into a place where we have some passionate desires for a specific relationship and particularly specific relationship with the soulmate, but also passionate desire for a relationship with God. So you've already developed a bit of a passionate relationship like desire for God, haven't you? Yes. And this is what I think of when you speak of these things Good. is that I can see that after our initial discussions, I had suddenly an overwhelming sense of desire for certain things. Once there was a small amount of faith in God and God's love, then suddenly I felt voracious almost in my desire to, to grow and to learn and to release and to love others and to serve others on the earth. There was so much. I feel overwhelmed by the abundance of experiences that were here given to me and the, the many helpers that I had to help me go through that process. And yet I come to here and it as if I have frozen in some sense. I, the thing that keeps me here and asking more, not just of yourselves, but of the people here, is that I feel I have some established faith in God. Obviously, it has deficits, but I feel that 
the absence of desire for this intimacy almost surprised me. <laughs> I, yeah. Suddenly, I, it was as if I wasn't thinking about anything. I was full of desire and full of joy and growth and, and wonder. And then all of a sudden, oh, <laughs> something was in my way. Yes, and yes. I will not say it, this has been painful. Yeah. It, it has not been without pain, this, yeah, this part of my... Uh, all of it, I suppose it's funny, isn't it? There's been pain, much pain, as you know, yeah. a lot yeah. of pain, but there is something very specific and about the pain that does not flow, that is a very difficult, or or a pain in the in the stopping of flow within the soul. I suppose you yes. would say it is of the, all of my desire and enthusiasm suddenly feeling <gasps> halted. That feels like a kind of pain in and of itself. Yeah. So what happens with most people is they feel, you know, as you did early, early on in your progress, you, you start, you embraced all of your emotions in the process of embracing your emotions. This is your emotional trauma. So you, you, you allowed yourself to go through the emotional trauma as an experience. But then you came to the point by the time you reached the third sphere around about you, you were starting to see this process of self-discovery, weren't you? Yes. And, and so you went through from the third sphere to the fifth sphere this strong sort of process of self-discovery. But the problem is our, our concept of self is flawed. We see ourselves as an individual and not as half of an individual. Mm -hmm. You see, God's concept of self is not one half of an individual, but rather the whole soul. And so we, we see ourselves as half of, our, half of the individual. We sort of see ourselves as an individual joining to another half is how we perceive it. Mm -hmm. That's not how it really is because... We are just one half of a, of a whole that is already joined and just has blockages between the two halves that, can't, that, that are preventing a proper joining to occur, to occur okay. in terms of a conscious joining. And so, so what we end up doing is we end up going, well, okay, I'm going to develop myself. I'm really enjoying this process of discovering myself, not realizing that actually we're only discovering half of ourselves. And, and, and our belief systems that are prior to that point uh, have caused us to believe that that's our whole self. Mm. So, so we believe we're discovering our whole self when the reality is we're really only discovering half of ourselves. And by the time we reach the fifth fear on, in God's way, we're starting to, to realise that, oh, there's something blocked. There's a blockage of flow of emotion between myself, myself now being the two halves. There's something going on that is blocking all of that. And, and it's usually something within ourselves of course so so something some 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 of, you could say of the residual trauma of living life on earth and the residual belief systems and the residual values and in particular our residual lack of faith about how god's created the soul that is causing a blockage between myself and my other half the other half of me and so so i so i focus on developing just me thinking that i am my complete self mm -hmm only to discover by the time I reach the fifth sphere that actually I'm not my complete self. There's a other half of me and I haven't even started the discovery process of that part of me. Mm. And, and that is where a lot of uh, trauma arises because we're, we're, we're so blocked to the other half we're, because of this issue of intimacy. We don't understand what God designed intimacy to be. And in our discussion this morning, remember, I, I said to Mary about intimacy that, uh, well, uh, it, about like relation, uh, relationship is not, is not really a, anything to do with the other person or lack of trust in the other. Yes, and please, I remembered <laughs> that I went on so much. This is what you would really like. This was so interesting and wonderful to hear. And this is what you would really like to talk about. So please let yeah. us talk about the issue and the fallacy of trust. Yes. So in our discussion this morning, uh, as you could see, this whole concept of trust comes from, as we've already said, this fear-based perspective on earth that, that we have to trust somebody before we can feel their emotions and trust somebody before we can give them our emotions. 
And both of those things are not actually true. The, the reality is we are safer, actually, if, if we look at true safety from God's perspective, we are safer to feel and experience every emotion that comes to us and every one of our own emotions. And, if, uh, and, so, and, and God designed the universe to be safe. So any, any word that indicates a lack of safety, trust, indicates an opposite, a lack of trust. And like safety indicates the opposite, a lack of safety. Any words that indicate this duality, if you like, of safety versus lack of safety, trust versus lack of trust, they're all indicating fears that exist within us that we need to address emotionally. We need to release them. We need to let them go emotionally. And if we let them go emotionally, we will start seeing that the real issue is not to do with trust of another, mm. not to do with safety, but rather this feeling that we cannot cope with certain parts of our own emotions. Yes, and this, so without, with full surrender emotionally, which is something I say I thought I had done. But, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but but with, now know you have not. <laughs> that's right, because yeah. I've found myself gra grappling with feeling I cannot trust. And in fact, I cannot trust so much that I do not want to know who he is. <laughs> um, or even meet him or anything. Yes. And as you say, with full surrender emotionally, there is no necessity for a sense of trust. That's right, because when we're fully surrendered emotionally, we know, and, and this gets a lot, we must first look at this point that if to fully surrender emotionally, we must have like complete faith in the way God created our soul. And the way God created our soul is to feel and experience emotion. That is the safest place for our soul. That is the place of pure safety, the, the real safety that we have in the universe is this place. And so we must first appreciate and, and learn to have, and develop faith in the way God created the soul to feel. And it's the lack of faith in that that causes us to believe in things like trust and safety and things like that. Because when we are feeling emotion, when we're capable of feeling all of our emotions, no matter what they are, we're no longer concerned about and how another person treats us. Because all of our concern about how another person may treat us is all to do with fears that we have inside of ourselves that are yet to be released. So obviously, if we had no fear inside of ourselves that is yet to be released, we would not be concerned about how another person treats us. And so then we would be open to experiencing all of their emotion and open to experiencing all of our emotion with them and even if some of that results in some uh, potential uh, like difficult situation to deal with emotionally, because I've got complete trust in my ability to deal with my own emotion and complete trust in the way God's designed a soul, I deal with it. And I'm not afraid of dealing with it. And so this creates a place where you're very, very safe internally. And so therefore you're not projecting the lack of safety onto another which is what most people do in their relationships. Mm. Mm. It's wonderful. <laughs> yes, it's, a, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? Because it simplifies the, relate, the problems in a relationship, doesn't it, yes. really? It takes all the problem away from being the other person's problem yes. <laughs> and refocuses it back onto something you can actually change <laughs> because it's something inside of yourself. And I see now that with fully feeling comes discernment and therefore my fears of a lack of safety or perhaps being harmed through this connection is also contrary to some other things that I have learned about God, although I still, this, obviously I'm still grappling to fully understand these things. Mm. And perhaps what we need to do is just talk a little bit about how to remove that problem. Because, yes. it, because that, that's probably, everybody that I've ever met on earth has this problem. And they, you know, you see it playing out in relationships all the time, whether the relationships are between soulmates or other couples even. You see these relationship issues of safety and fear and everything really playing out. And a lot of people call it love, but it's actually not love at all that's going on. It's just codependent addiction where... I feel safe being with you, you feel safe being with me, so we'll have a relationship. 
you feel I, that I care for you, I, I feel that you care for me, so we have a relationship, then that's, that's not what a soulmate relationship is, is about. There is no onus on the other person to do any of those things, care for you, make you feel safe, make you feel secure, make you, make you feel like you can trust or any of those things. In fact, our demand that somebody does that for us is an unloving demand. Yes, and perhaps I could uh, say from my experience, I'm not sure that I have severe demands at this point that others give me those senses. Yes. But because in my most early earth-based experiences, there were situations where I felt, and I do understand that this is not true intimacy, but where I felt that I had no choice about sexual intimacy, for example. Yes, uh, where, where you were raped or harmed on earth. Yes. There was so much uh, lack of um, privacy or intrusion into myself and my, my desires and my life that... Now it feels, I feel so happy. <laughs> I have felt so happy until this point <laughs> that I do not, I do not need, I, I have learned there is a sense of safety that I can have as my, as my own self. Uh, and in God's universe, one is very safe, especially when feeling, again, so I thought. But then when it comes to considering a situation which I hadn't realised, but it seems that it will be sexual, for example, and my earliest experiences of sexuality were, were violent. violent. Uh, and also uh, there's things here that I can't articulate very well, but about my personality that I don't feel safe that someone else won't control them in some way try to manipulate you or move you away from your personality into some other yes doing some other thing other than what your personality demands yes as a slave one had an absolutely no control over what even what job i did and so i feel good that i can have these things for myself alone but when it comes to drawing closer to another person it feels very unsafe <laughs> yeah, but see, see Gigi, what, what i feel you're missing out here though is that you said right at the beginning of that little uh, talk that you just gave me <laughs> you said you don't feel that you have any demands but all of the feelings that you just described all create demands yes the demand on another to not to, to not control me well, there's, there's not only that, the demand of another, there, there's not only the demand to not control or anything. See, there's a difference between a demand to not control and, and just a feeling, well, I'm not going to be controlled. The, so mm -hmm. the demand to have them not control is a, is a fear that they will control you, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, right? I see this now from yeah. our discussion. So the fear that they will control you turns into a demand that they don't control you, but it's still expressed externally. It's not... It's not something that's going on internally. Internally, if you felt like there was, there's no way anybody could control you anymore, if you really felt that, mm -hmm. then you wouldn't have these other feelings, can you see? You wouldn't, you wouldn't feel unsafe or, or uh, that the situation can't be trusted because you would already know that whatever you need to experience, you can experience. And if you need to leave, you can leave. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You'd already feel all that. The, the issue is you don't feel that. That's where the fears are, you see. Mm -hmm. And you don't feel that. And that's why you feel afraid of having the relationship. So, so the, the key thing to see is that those fears always create demands. In this case, the primary demand is, I don't want to even know my soulmate. And that is a demand. That's a demand you're pushing out onto God and the universe and everybody, if you think mm -hmm. about it. Don't tell me who my soulmate is. And if you could talk to spirits who are in a higher place who have met this almost like, oh, we want you to <laughs> we want you to know who your soulmate is. Why would we not want you to know who your soulmate is? You know, it's a lovely re relationship. You you get to experience all these other things and, and we need to talk a little bit about what things you can experience in that relationship in a minute. But you can see there's a demand upon all those people, <laughs> even though it's softly, softly exp expressed because you're now in the fifth sphere and therefore have a 
have love in you, you know. It's not, it's not like you're in the hills having this demand because that, then it would be very different, right? Yes, that's right. And yeah. my previous demands were very exactly. overbearing. But, but they're still demands, really, mm. because they're still uh, preventing or, or they're resisting God's truth from being able to enter you on the subject, you see. So there's still a demand, you know. Every person who resists something has a demand coming out of them. And, and we need to start seeing them as demands, even though they might be very softly and, and gently expressed. <laughs> they are very firm. In fact, by the time you reach the fifth fear, sometimes they're more firm, aren't they? It's like more firm than they were back then, you know, in, in earlier times because you're more developed and you have more of a sense of yourself. And so you're more firm about unloving treatment of mm. yourself and so mm. forth. And so, and so when you think that something's unloving towards you, in this case, that being told who your soulmate is, in, in a real emotional sense, the faith is saying, I'm afraid of that. So, so if the faith is saying that, that means that, that you don't want anybody to tell you. Mm-hmm. And, and in that place, that, that is a very strong no <laughs> coming out of you about the subject. You see what I'm saying? Yes. And, and we don't see, uh, because it's gently expressed emotionally, right, instead of being an overt yelling, screaming thing, yeah. <laughs> it's gently expressed emotionally, we feel, oh, it's not a demand anymore. But it is really still a demand. Mm. It's really still something coming out of us onto the rest of the people who are in our environment that we don't know a specific thing. Mm. So that's the first thing I'd like to say about the demand issue, right? <laughs> the, the other thing I'd like to talk about is the actual soulmate relationship is about Having, having the other person feeling, uh, choosing, choosing through emotionally, choosing emotionally to feel the other person's emotions all the time. Mm. And then, uh, and also choosing emotionally to express your emotions to them all the time. Mm. Right? And then they, of course, would need to do the same. So they would eventually get to the stage where they express all of their emotions towards you all the time and they choose to feel all of your all of your emotions for them all the time now the problem for you at the moment is that being in that state causes a lot of these old residual earth-based experiences where you were controlled manipulated uh, violently abused and all of those things all start coming up and up until now you could sort of deny them to a degree because you're in a nice environment you've become more loving person you receive some more of god's love and addressed a lot of the love-based issues generally and so and because you haven't had an intimate relationship you could you could prevent going through those blockages that actually cause a block between you and the other half of you so because i have let go of much of my anger about those things and what I thought was my grief and mm-hmm. even some fear. I'm sure that I have let go of some fear. Certainly. But you haven't obviously let go of it all because no. if you had of, and, and particularly the fear that is surrounding the, the exercise of your will, your free will, your, mm. you, particularly the fear surrounding that because if you examine a, a lot of what you've already said to me about it to, this morning and now, you can see that the the fear of somebody overtaking your will mm. is is quite large mm. naturally so if you think about your history mm. it's going to naturally it's going to be quite large and so that is something you you will need to allow yourself to go through but that that's on the you remember we talked about the the darker emotions and then the neutral and then the positive ones yes. so on the darker side there's going to be fears surrounding have being taken over emotionally and physically, mm-hmm. which which the soulmate uh, uh, relationship does do, but it's a choice. It's not it's not um, it's not forced upon you. It, it's mm-hmm. it's only through your choice that it can happen. So so obviously are not secure that that's true at this stage because if you if you were you would you wouldn't be so afraid of it, right? Mm. Emotionally, I mean. But what you said this morning yep. was that. If I do choose to feel, for example, all of his emotions Mm -hmm. um, or feel it's 
are you saying I feel his condition, what he is feeling? I'm not feeling them for him. I'm just feeling him. Is that what you mean? Yes. So it's, yes, you feel, you you allow yourself to feel him. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't actually feel another person's emotions for them. Mm -hmm. You can only That's... feel your response to their emotions and feel what their emotions are, right? So so this is in this uh, so so there's. And, and this is really the second part of it. The first part was the release of the fears associated with it. Well, would there be then a release of the fears if I just choose to do that? Of course. Yes. Of course. It, it, it seems the, that is the best option. That's right. You remember in your progress up to now, every time you exercise a desire to go through something, fears naturally came up and yes. you dealt with them. Yes. And that's the same with this particular situation. You can do it a slow way or a fast way. The slow way is to look at every single blocking emotion and release it, but that will only bring you to neutral. <laughs> so it's still not really addressing the problem. Can you see? Yes, and how does one get from then neutral to the next state? To actually experiencing a desire, yes. So, so to experience a desire for anything, what have you had to do up to now, if you think about that? Well, think about it, feel about it. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't analysed it very much. No. I've, I've had experiences that I enjoyed and I wanted more. Yes, but... Or even if I didn't enjoy them, they were good. Yeah, but what, when, what caused you to have the first experience? See, there's, there's a time with every, with every new bit of information you receive, there's a time when it's just information, <laughs> isn't there? Mm. And and then you choose to you choose to act upon the information for some reason. Why? Why was there a choice to act upon the information? Well, pain and love. I was in a lot of pain and I received some love. Okay. And that made me want something different. Uh, did it make you want something different? Didn't you have to know what was different before you could want it? Like, yes, the possibility. Yes. The, you, the truth, the truth. <laughs> exactly. You, you needed to have the truth about the possibility, didn't you? Yes. Can you see that? That, that was sort of, it's, it's easy to ignore that as a part of the steps, but that's the real thing that happened first, isn't it? Yeah. So, so for example, in our first discussion when, we, when you were earthbound, I drew you into a truth yes. that you could release, that you could get out of the pain you're in. Right? That was the truth. And, and that truth caused you to go, oh, I'm going to experiment with that. Yeah. And you did straight away, right? And then you felt the benefit. Mm -hmm. So you had an actual experience that caused you to have some faith. Yes. Because remember, faith is the reality that you experience through the experience. So, so that causes an increase in your faith. Mm -hmm. And so now you feel, oh, more truth would be good. <laughs> which is what happened after that remember you you started progressing through your anger and your rage and your repentance process remember yes. we talked a bit more about some truth about the repentance process and what it was going to feel like remember that yes and then you decided to go through that process yes but but we had to talk about the truth about it first yes that's true and in establishing the truth about it you then could determine do you have a desire for that truth yet or not now, when you determined that you wanted the truth, that caused the next thing to do, which was to have an experiment mm -hmm. to see whether the experience would work, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Wasn't it? So, so now we've received the truth and we did an experiment about that truth to see whether it works and it worked. So this is why when you started progressing, you realized, oh, this is all working and this is working very rapid. I'm just going to keep doing that. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's what caused you to keep doing it, isn't it? When you look at it. Yes. Yeah. So, so now we're at the fist fist and we're looking at our soulmate stuff and we're going, oh, I don't want to hear any truth about yes. it. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what happened. I just wasn't humble enough to admit that really to myself, yeah. that everything stopped because I stopped wanting the truth about wanting it. Wanting truth about it. Yes. I felt, I feel that this is what you meant about releasing the fears first, yeah. isn't it? So, so the question was, how do I get from neutrality to you know positive desire? Well, obviously, you, you've you've now got the faith that any negative emotion you can release, you know you can release. Yes. So even this 
this uh, emotion that you have about your will being controlled is an emotion mm -hmm. and and it's a matter of releasing it and to be frank most people do start releasing it in the fifth fear mm. so it's a, it's a normal part of that process so that mm. they start releasing that fear but then they're in neutral what's going to get them out of neutral and into positive is receiving the truth about the soulmate relationship and receiving the truth about who the soulmate is where they are that's going to cause a lot of stuff to come up right just like any other truth yeah. has and you can experiment with oh my emotions are now flowing and remember you just said earlier which is a, which is also another truth that every time you block emotion that's when you feel the most pain like that, that so it's really hard that place you know yeah. so so you've seen me recently you know i've just started to open up to some emotions that have been blocking for a few years and i've been in pain for a few years as a result of it right and this is what we do you see with emotion we block it block it block it block it because we're blocking truth on the matter and we're blocking the emotional experience on the matter that's what keeps us in this neutral place, mm. right? And then, and so we've got to receive the truth emotionally, allow ourselves to experience whatever emotions are going to come up as a result of those, mm. of the reception of that truth, and then we'll start moving forward again. And that, that's the natural process of moving out of neutrality and into desire. Because mm. every time you had an experience, if you think about the past experience, every time you had an experience, an individual experience, that that you could measure the result as a positive result you embraced it further yes. any experience that was negative and you see it as a negative result you stopped trying to embrace those experiences didn't you yes yeah so so now uh, this is the same process with the soulmate issue really it's exactly the same issue we need to receive the truth about it then we need to act upon that truth but we we also need to feel our emotions about that truth don't we yes once we do that, then the blockages are released about that truth, but also we're feeling our emotions about that truth. Now there's a potential of some desire growing mm -hmm. about that particular experience. So really there is no such thing as neutral because in order to get to neutral, I must have been blocking truth. And the only reason I would block truth is because of fear. That's right. And so really it's not, I wasn't as neutral as I thought. There is still... That's fear right. there is still pain in me so thank you yes and yes. And, it's very and this is why the discussion is so in, in, important because most people on the earth do believe there is a place called neutral mm. <laughs> they do and and it is a fallacy to believe in it it's a, it, all it does is support the fact that there are certain things we are blocking purposefully blocking that we don't want to address mm. right and people can stay in neutral, as you've observed people on Earth now that you're helping them. You can see they can stay in neutral for a long time. Yes. And when you really analyse what's going on, they're not in neutral. They, are, they have a faith that's actively developed to disbelieve that God's truth. Mm -hmm. They have a faith that's actively developed to deny the truth that's coming to them, even in their personal lives. That's why they're in this place where they're, they're not moving forward or moving anywhere positive, right? Yes, and I suppose for people that I've been assisting on earth, it seems so evident the pain that they are holding on to Certainly. or the false beliefs that they are holding on to. And well, that, that's that because though why... you've dealt with those same false beliefs yourselves. Yes. So, so you can easily see what those, you know, what the, it is in someone else then, right? That's right. And here in this environment, when one has done some work on oneself, there is... Uh, as I have just demonstrated, there can be a tendency to think that all of that is finished and it's just a case of developing a desire when I ought to know by now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, know, you say you ought to know by now, but, you know, the reality is when it comes to intimate relationships, there is a large amount of damage on the earth, even for a person who hasn't been abused or hasn't been harmed or violently hurt sexually there are still quite severe amounts of damage in the soul of those people. And for someone who's had the additional effect, you know, trauma that you've had, obviously that's going to be even more so, more the case. Mm. And, and so the key is to just say, oh, these are the residual and sometimes more difficult to identify effects of, a, of belief systems that are imbibed on earth due to experiences that happened there. 
And, and so we carry those belief systems into our spirit life and into our future. And, and the other thing I need to say too, though, is that God, God's way is very interesting in that even when you reach the ninth sphere of the spirit world, so you're at one with God, you will still find within yourself areas that you, don't, that you are not letting yourself receive the truth about. Mm. Right? And that is a still, still going to be a choice. So, so while you've, when you're at one with God, there are no more negative emotions to address. There's no more fears to address. But that doesn't change the fact that you don't have desires on mm. specific issues that God wants you to experience desire on. Mm-hmm. And so that's why there's so much development between the ninth and the 36th to go through, because that's all about learning how to have desires in all of these very refined areas of your life. So in that case, a person is without fear and pain, yes. but has not yet developed a desire. So the state I thought I was in is possible, but it's not what's it's happening for me now. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's not. And, and, and this also applies to every sixth fear spirit you will meet. Mm-hmm. If you think about it, every sixth fear spirit is in a state where they have no desire for God. Mm-hmm. And to, to move beyond the sixth fear into the seventh, a desire for God must be developed. God's designed the, the movement. And the reason why it must be developed is because the soul can't grow without some of God's love transforming it beyond that point. So God designed the soul to be transformed by God's love, but the sixth fear spirit is afraid of that transformation. Mm-hmm. But they don't see it as fear, do they? No. Any one of them you might have met already, they don't see it as fear. They see it as, oh, I'm just neutral about the issue of God. You know, I know God exists or whatever, but, um, you know, or you can even have be an atheist and be in the sixth fear, can't you? So yes. it just depends on the amount of love you have for people. So, so at the end of the day, you, you can be in this place that you're blocked and not seeing that it's based upon some trauma Mm-hmm. Right, and, and you can think it's neutrality, mm-hmm. but but it really the only time you really have neutrality on an issue is by the by the time you reach the eighth sphere. <laughs> then there's a, then there's a whole slew of issues that you probably have neutrality on that you've never. And when I say neutrality on the general experiences, you've never heard of them before. Yes, you've never experienced them before. You don't even know about them. You don't even know about the possibilities of them. Yes, but you yeah. wouldn't block the truth about them. Correct. You wouldn't actively block the truth about them. You wouldn't come to a standstill as I have. That's right. You, there, you, may, you may not have desire, the positive part of it, to find out about them, but you're not actively blocking, blocking them either. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense to you? It does. Whereas in the, uh, anything below the seventh sphere, you are actively blocking something. Mm. It's just a matter of working out what it is and, and then working your way through those particular issues. But also, we often actively do not have desire because we want to block that thing. Mm. So on this case, of, on the soulmate issues, most people, when they reach the sixth sphere, the fifth sphere, do slow down a bit in their development mm. for that reason because they still want to uh, actively block all of these, uh, you know, hurt, hurt beliefs about intimacy and the use of your will. And also they are about identity. Who, what makes you? See, up until the fifth sphere, you believed what makes you is you. Yes. But, but that's not God's truth. God's truth is, no, you're half of you. Mm. So, so, so if you haven't discovered the other half of you, yet, you're still not mm. wanting to discover half of yourself, right? Mm. That's God's truth about it. So, so that can help us then identify and see, well, wow, that, that means that I must be blocking some things here. I must be trying to shut down some things here. Mm. Mm. Was there more that you wished to say about intimacy? Well, I, I don't know if I can remember uh, the rest of our discussion from this morning now, but it, there was a lot of things that are, it, it feels to me like, um, True intimacy is, is a, between you and your other half. Obviously, God designed it between soulmates, true mm-hmm. intimacy. Of course, other relationships can be intimate to a degree. And the relationship with God is intimate to it, isn't it, as well? Yes. But the soulmate relationship is specifically different because it's not really a relationship. Yes, this is why <laughs> I, when you said it's really me and then... 
I started to have all kinds of crazy thoughts about how can I be intimate with me? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it, it's not really a it's, a, it's a state of fully allowing the soul's expression and not realize when, what happens on earth if we imbibe all these false beliefs that block the full allowance of the soul's expression. Mm. Now, the individual soul, which is made of the two halves, for it to be consciously aware of itself, it has to have a complete flow of emotion between the two halves of the soul. So the two halves of the soul, to, and, and in the union state, that is now seamless. There are no, there are no barriers to it, uh -huh. right? In the, in the uh, state where you're in at the moment, there's a lot of barriers to that. So even though you'd, you've you received a lot of love and you've, got, and you've gotten a lot of these other things done, just, you know, in terms of release of the trauma, there's still barriers to the flow of emotion between, between the soul, in the soul itself. Mm -hmm. So this is a part of the self-discovery process, yes. bearing in mind that self is not just you. Yes. Self is also this other half of you. You're only one half of you. So, so if you can think of the two halves sort of linking together, at the moment you could say your two halves are, you know, butting up against each other but not really linking together. To link together, there needs to be a conscious flow of information. And by information, I'm talking about all forms of energy. You know, so I'm talking about thoughts, feelings, uh, you know, emotions, experiences, memories, everything. Mm -hmm. Now, and that, that's what causes the soulmate relationship to bind, right, mm -hmm. to, to, to combine. And so, so when you think about true intimacy from a soulmate perspective, it's really you becoming one, not seeing yourselves as two halves anymore, mm -hmm. but you are now one. Now, that's never going to be the same with any other relationship, even the relationship with God. It, when you become at one with God in the sense of love with God, you're still not at one in terms of knowledge and in truth or in these other things because God has far more. It's God's infinite has far more knowledge of truth that we have. So even when you're at one with God in love, you're still not at one with God in all these other aspects of God's nature or personality. But with your soulmate, you can obtain that condition where you are completely at one on everything you, you you have one thought you have one feeling you have one emotion you have one intention you have one desire it's the same for both halves it's and and both of you experience it exactly the same way and in fact you get to the point where when you're you're in the union state you don't even see yourselves of both of you experiencing it it's mm -hmm. one of you experiencing it mm -hmm. you are one mm. right and, and this is why there's a lot of confusion about soulmate relationship on earth. Everyone on earth to a degree feels, you know, something about the soulmate relationship. And this is why there's a lot of uh, beliefs on earth about there's one special person for you and all those kind of things. That, that all comes from this soulmate relationship, but it's very, very damaged in the way that it's viewed here. Um, and so that damage has to be released. But even after that damage is released, it's about developing this oneness of thought and feeling. So you know how you have the concept of, you know, like when you communicate in the spirit world, you can communicate sort of almost telepathically. Like you yes. get to the stage, and particularly when you become at one with God, you're at the stage where everything is sort of telepathic, really. That's not the same as having one thought. No. Telepathic thought is a transmission of a thought from one soul, one person to another person. That's telepathy. But but having one thought is what the soul is capable of. Mm. So the two halves having one thought, one emotion. And the reason why that is so confronting for you now is because of all of those, the damage stuff about, yes. you know, how people have taken over your, taken over your body without, and taken over your life and taken over your experience without you having any control over it. And then on top of that, um, why would you want to desire that when you've got all of these feelings associated with, uh, you know, I, I, would, I want to feel that I am me, not that somebody else in the end and I will have one thought or one feeling or one emotion. Yes. You know, see, and so that, that's why it's such a confronting uh, period of time, this time when you sort of discover the concept of soulmate um, without yet feeling through the emotions uh, involved with that concept. Yes, it's almost as if re, re, 
conceptualizing myself. Well, that, that is exactly what is happening because up until the fifth sphere, you've conceptualized yourself as an individual. Mm. But when you reach the fifth sphere, what you start doing is you start seeing that you're not an individual yet. The individual requires a merging of its two halves, right? That be then you'll become an individual. And so you're now discovering the other half. And so, so you could say you've been in, involved in a process where you've been involved in a self-discovery process. Yes. But, but it's only a half of self-discovery process. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes. And, and the other half of self-discovery process hadn't begun yet. Yes. And, and now you have the opportunity, God's saying, well, you got to the fifth sphere, but this is as far as you're going to go, actually, <laughs> unless you're willing to discover the other half of yourself, you know, because God, God doesn't want a relationship with, with half of you. Mm -hmm. God wants a relationship with the whole soul, right? That God, the soul is God's child. Mm. Not not just one half of the soul. So we've got to start seeing ourselves as a, we're only just one half and we've got to work through these emotional issues, but we've also got to work through the lack of desire for truth on the matter mm. in order to get to the stage where we actually feel ourselves to be one. Yes. Completely one. Where, where and, and like in the union state, a thought arises and both have the thought at the same time, both halves. And that's why there is no such thing as two halves anymore, mm -hmm. because both have the same thought at the same time. But everything's happening at the same time. Same feeling, same thought, same emotion, same, same intention, same desire, same passion, same memory, same experience. Right? Mm. And as you know, as you grow, you can think faster, you can feel faster, you can do everything more rapidly. So imagine two of you in this combined state doing everything more rapidly what what an immense how how would that enhance your experience it, you know, obviously it, it it adds to you know concept the difference between bliss in the eighth sphere with the one that we got and bliss in the 36 at one that with the soul at completely different experience because it's only half of the soul in the eighth sphere that's at one with god in love in the 36th sphere, it's both of you in the same state with all this additional knowledge, all these additional experiences, and all these, all these intentions and emotions and everything are all happening all at the same time for both halves, and there's not even a conception of half anymore. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> well, there is much for me to learn. <laughs> I certainly, I can feel I'm confronted by what you're speaking of, but I have faith that uh, I can work through this and I thank you again for your generosity with me. That's my pleasure. Uh, I also noticed that you've got, we've got quite a few visitors about this subject. Yes. So maybe yes. you could just mention how many visitors we had. The eavesdropping <laughs> on this subject of soulmate issue <laughs> from the spirit world. Hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because it, it is in the fifth sphere that we go through these experiences and many sort of get a bit hung up on the experiences in the fifth sphere as a result. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the faster we can conceptualise the full experience that God intends for us, the faster we can move through whatever the blockages are, but also we can develop a desire for the truth of it mm -hmm. and, and use, and, and you know, the conscience again is God's mechanism of sharing that truth with us. So really what you've been saying to God is, I demand you do not share <laughs> with me. Yes, I, I'm not aware of it being so <laughs> but I, so harsh, but I mm. can see that is the case. Yeah. It is as if in my whole journey from the beginning of my life on earth and now until this point, there has been so, much, so many changes in my self-concept or Perhaps in my life on earth, not at all. But since I've, even in, since my arrival here, my concept of self has changed in certain ways mm. many times, but not in this global sense that you are now speaking of. Mm. And, uh, you know, if we, we've got to remember that God has a, an infinite nature and therefore it's highly likely that as we receive more and more of God's qualities, we'll discover more and more things about ourselves that we never knew before. So 
it's almost like you've got to get used to that as well as a process of getting overwhelmed about, oh, you discover this new thing about yourself, a new thing about yourself, a new thing about yourself. And mm. in the end, it's not about one half of yourself even. Mm. You're discovering this new thing about your whole self, mm -hmm. to, uh, which is you and the other half combined as one. And you're discovering new things together, but you don't even see it as together. You are one. <laughs> yeah. so you just, but, but it's all still discovery. And, and my, my feelings are that that discovery process, this, this discovery process of self will continue mm -hmm. like for the rest of our existence. So mm -hmm. it, 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 if you reach a soul union place, I don't believe that that is the end of discovery because mm -hmm. obviously there must be still more to discover. It's almost like what we've got to do first is we've got to come into ourselves a bit. And when I say ourselves, I mean the half of self. Then we've got to see that the half of ourself isn't really ourself anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and then we become at one with God. So that's all about, you know, sharing, you know, discovering God as well. But then as we continue with this discovery of ourselves process and receiving more information, knowledge and truth and love from God to discover ourselves, we get to the point where we realize that once we're in the, even the union state, it's like we're just like now the baby ready to be taught. Mm. And, and it's hard to conceive that when you've already gone through so much processes of discovery, yes. but that's how it is. You, 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 you really now, now God's got soul to soul connection with you in that state, in that union state that before then he's only had soul to half soul connection. Mm. So his soul to half of your soul connection. Even when you're in the, even when you're in the celestial heavens, there's still something separating the two halves. But once you make the transition into the union state, now there's nothing separating the two halves. So now you could say the soul is capable of education as a soul, mm. which is different to being capable of education as a half of a soul. So are you saying that even though I might re, uh, re understand myself, have a different self concept in the fifth sphere, yep. I still won't be unified with my soulmate for quite some time to come, even after I'm at one with God? That's right. Mm. Yeah, you won't be unified. Probably, you know, if uh, for myself in the first century, I I reached the tenth sphere on Earth in the first century while I was on Earth, and Mary reached around about the third sphere while she was on Earth, right? But even in the tenth sphere while I was on Earth, you can see for union between my soul to occur, our soul to occur, Mary would have had to be in the same condition of myself at least, wouldn't she? But even when we were in the same condition, because there were higher spheres where Mary and myself were in exactly the same condition, and we almost made the transition at exactly the same time, usually myself a little bit earlier, but within a few moments sometimes Mary made the same transition, but we were still making them separately as two halves. Mm. But the final transition, the one that converts into union space with the soul, you make together mm. because that's the end of your development as separate individuals, as conceiving yourselves to be separate individuals. Because mm -hmm. that's really all it is. It's about removing conceptions and learning new things mm -hmm. about the fact that you're not a, an individual as just one half. Mm -hmm. But rather you are only an individual when, you've, but when you no longer see yourselves as one half of each other. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so that, that's an interesting process to go through. And, and that took me, if we, we, I was summarising, that took myself and Mary the next nearly 2,000 years mm -hmm. of time, Earth time. So how strange that one must begin to reconceptualise here in the fifth sphere and yet not the... Yes, and not complete that change of self-concept. Well, we probably need to be a bit more specific than that, don't we? Because we begin to conceptualise it in the fifth sphere only if we are on God's way. You see, the soulmate relate. There are many six-sphere spirits who have soulmate relationships. Many don't either, by the way. But there are many that do, but they do not conceptualise themselves as one. They only conceptualize, still conceptualise themselves as separate individuals. Mm. They've, they've mm, just grown in enough love to exist in the sixth sphere. Mm -hmm. So we need to say clearly to our, particularly to our audience, that while in the fifth sphere we may start changing our conception of self, that usually is only happening because we've got God's voice speaking through the conscience. Mm. 
about the matter of soulmates. Mm -hmm. And for those people who don't have that happening, that the fifth sphere experience, fifth sphere experience is different. Mm. Yeah. But even yet, my point remains, yes. does it not? Yes, it, it does. It takes a very long time. It takes a long time to... Uh, well, firstly, remember, when, to get to the eighth sphere, you've got to remove all of the... Let's call it the mud that's been thrown at you. Mm -hmm. So you've got to remove all that trauma. But from the eighth sphere on, you, a lot of the soulmate the relationship is about desire and passion, mm -hmm. and longing and, and development of those particular traits in all avenues and of your possible development. Mm -hmm. right? And this is where um, things often slow down a bit for spirits because, because both have to learn these particular things and also but both have to do it as halves because they, they are still holding on to concepts that are opposite to the other half. Mm -hmm. So there are many times when I had a new concept in myself that Mary still had the old concept with. So that creates some degree of separation mm -hmm. in the flow of emotion, the flow of experience, the flow of memories and so forth. Once you get to have one concept, now there is no blockage in the flow of anything. Yeah. Okay. So that's why it takes so long. It requires the, you could say, the exercise of the will of both halves who still conceive themselves to be halves. Yes. And, and on top of that, for us, of course, nobody was there to tell us what to do. Yes. So, so for us, being the first people to do it, nobody could tell us what to do. And so naturally, it takes longer for them the first person to make those transitions than it would do for the others who, who can be told at least the truth concepts that they are blocking from God. Mm. Yeah. Much still yet ahead of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you again for your time it's and I pleasure. won't intrude further. Well, what, what I'd like to do though is at some point when you do discover who your soulmate actually is <laughs> and you're willing to have a talk about that, Yes. We would love to hear from you and uh, hear, hear, hear where he is and who he is and, <laughs> and so forth. And, you know, you never know. You might find that uh, you may have even known him when you're on earth. Mm. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you again. No, it's our pleasure. <laughs> See you later, Gigi. Mm.